What happens when you can compress a year or 10 years or a hundred years, or maybe even a thousand years into a single day? Well, that's a world thanks to artificial intelligence of science, art, and even ideas that is radically changing today. And we will feel the effects of this as a society very, very soon. So let's take a look. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. First of all, my every six month public service announcement, these dots on my head, and there's a couple on my hands and stuff too, are liquid nitrogen burning off some precancerous spots on my body. If you're over 40, you should definitely go to the dermatologist, have your skin checked. I have managed to avoid actually having any skin cancers because I've gone every six months for the past 10 years or so. So take it from me, you definitely wanna go. If you're over a certain age, you want to have them check it out. So consider this a PSA, and hopefully one or two of you will thank me later. So today's video is one of my favorite kinds of videos to do. It's a synthetic video where I actually watched three different videos. It was actually four, but I didn't include the fourth one. But anyway, I watched three different videos on YouTube in the last 24 hours, and they kind of got my brain thinking about things. It got me thinking about how radically the world is changing today right now with new scientific discoveries and discoveries in art and philosophy as well. But I'll focus mostly on science in this particular episode and how even though it doesn't quite seem like it from a general society level, what we're seeing is a scientific revolution happening right now. And it's all due to AI being an assistant to and helping out human researchers to do their work so much more rapidly than they could ever have done previous to AI being in existence. So first I want to play the introduction of Matthew Berman's really good video on an MIT researcher who took Sakana AI's AI scientist and gave it to a thousand people at a large research firm near MIT. I think that's probably Google considering that they just spent a billion dollars building new buildings in the Boston area. But anyway, if you don't know about Sakana AI, you can definitely check it out up here. I did a video on that previously. It's an AI researcher that's able to go and do most of the steps required to go from an idea, a scientific idea through the experimentation to validating the experimentation and then to publishing the paper. So it's a very impressive feat by this company out of Japan. If you would be interested in me doing a dedicated video about this research paper, definitely let me know in the comments. And while you're down there, if you don't mind liking and subscribing, that would be awesome. But anyway, let me play the intro and then talk about that for a second. What do you think is going to happen when artificial intelligence is making true scientific discoveries, actual new science that humans did not discover themselves? This is an absolute prerequisite for AI achieving ASI, artificial super intelligence. So Matthew goes on to talk about the holy grail of AI research right now, which is self-improving AI, right? That's, that's kind of the goal of all of this stuff is if you can have an AI that's able to improve itself, in other words, to produce offspring, <laughs> to evolve more or less on its own, then you can have a kind of a hockey stick moment in terms of the capability of artificial intelligence, which then gets us to ASI. But we're not quite there yet. Maybe we'll be there in a year. Maybe it's going to take five. Maybe it'll take 10. I don't know. But Matthew starts the whole video off by talking about what if AI could make fundamentally new scientific discoveries. And that, of course, got me thinking because then I started thinking about Demis Hassabis, who recently won a Nobel Prize, and congratulations, by the way, for AlphaFold. His team, you know, created this AlphaFold where it used to take years and a full PhD. It was called One Protein Fold Per PhD. AlphaFold 1, 2, and 3 is able to do, you know, hundreds and then thousands and now basically arbitrary numbers of protein folds. And that allows scientists now to really examine how proteins work in the world and how you might be able to recombine them to create new medicines, to be able to do life extension by combating aging and all sorts of other things that were simply not possible before. So this is something that already is out there today. And in fact, somebody won a Nobel Prize for it. Next is a little clip from Peter Diamandis's recent AI leadership forum, where Jack Hittery actually says that you either have to adopt AI or die. He's talking specifically about business, but I would say that is true for art and culture and thinking as well. Well, Peter, first of all, I'm very happy to see that we still have humans on the panel mm -hmm. instead of just AIs. In the so I think it's just I, I another mixed, few. I mixed the AI in this panel, yes. Okay. <laughs> another few FIIs, which is going to be avatars up here. Um, the mantra of AI or die is real. Mm -hmm. Is real. It's not just a phrase, it's happening right now, it's happening on several levels. And certainly companies and countries that do not engage will die. 
So that's a fairly strong statement right there, right? I mean, he's basically like, you don't adopt this, you will die. And I just mentioned in reference to Matthew Berman's video clip about evolution, how you're talking about AI evolving itself. Well, this is companies specifically, that's what Jack is talking about here. But again, I will expand that to researchers, to universities, to people working in the arts, to people working in philosophy, et cetera. If you don't adapt to this new artificial intelligence paradigm, you are going to evolve yourself out of things. Now, I don't think you're going to literally die, but you will become less and less relevant. The relevant developments in all of society, I think, are going to become more and more focused on AI. And it's not right now, again, that AI is taking over the world from us. It's that AI can be used with us as a collaborator to develop new science that has never been thought of before and to be able to do this at an incredibly accelerated pace. And that brings me to Ver and that brings me to the very recent Veritasium episode where Derek and his partners go to Corning and they talk about Gorilla Glass, the stuff that is in people's phones now, you know, the super unbreakable glass, and how much work even now, 15 years on, it is taking them to develop better and better, you know, shatter resistant, scratch resistant glass. But the scientists at Corning are constantly trying to refine the process to make the glass even more durable. There is a whole team at the facility that is dedicated to testing and measuring different glass prototypes. All right, we're displacing them by one and a half millimeters. Yep. Two millimeters. Whoop. And they really put the glass through its paces, conducting bending tests, scratching tests, and dropping heavy steel balls onto the glass. Three, two, one. They also have replica phones with different glasses for the screen, and they drop them from ever increasing heights. So we can go up a little bit and maybe. Right. I maybe we can imagine that I'm taking a selfie. All of this is to make the next version of Gorilla Glass even more durable than it already is. Like, are we doing this? If you want to. Hell yeah. 1.7 meters. Yeah, that's, that's roughly selfie height. Three, two, one. Amazing. Go down and pick that up. Still, Still survived. Dude, that's pretty wild. So as you heard in that clip, there is a team of people at Corning Glass specifically working on that. By the way, when I was a very small child, my grandparents lived in Syracuse. I got to go to the Corning Glass factory and watch them make glass. I mean, I must have been like four or five years old, but it was it was enough of a memory that I still remember that. So that's a cool little connection with Corning. But anyway, they have been working, you know, since 2006 with Steve Jobs to build a glass that is unbreakable. And as Derek talks about in the longer video, highly recommend it. I highly recommend watching all of these, by the way. But Derek talks about in the longer video how it took thousands of years, first of all, to discover that glass was a thing, and then more importantly, to go from opaque glass, in other words, glass you couldn't see through, like you know, this isn't glass, but you know, something you can't see through, to then semi-translucent, to then finally transparent glass. It took over a thousand years to figure out how to do that, with many, many people experimenting, just sort of blindly adding things to silicon dioxide to see what would make it become clear as opposed to different colors or opaque or something. And then it took hundreds of years after that to get from that, you know, basic, fragile, transparent glass, the brittle stuff that existed, quite beautiful, transparent, beautiful, but it was very fragile to something that you could then put on a computer screen, you could put as a lens of your camera, you could put as your phone screen or something like that. So all of this stuff is, is thousands of years worth of development. Now, just like with AlphaFold, imagine if you had a glass making AI, something that could go through and mathematically test out different formulations for glass to try to figure out something that is strong, scratch resistant, and not brittle. That's a very, very difficult combination because of what glass is. Glass is an amorphous solid, and so it's just going to be brittle by nature. It doesn't have a structure to stand up against things. So in order to make it more scratch resistant and less brittle, that's going to take a lot of work. And maybe there's another material that's not even glass at this point, something else that exists that would also be transparent, but would be more flexible. You know, there's that's the kind of thing, that's new science that an AI could enable to happen, or at least happen in a human lifetime, you know, time frame. In other words, going from a thousand years down to a hundred years or 10 years or one year, or even maybe one day, if you get a million of these things working simultaneously 24 hours a day on a big old server farm, and they're just cranking through all these different chemical formulations and then mathematically testing them out. And then out of that group of research, 
research, they produce their top 10 results or something like that and hand that off to a human scientist to then go and actually physically test in the world and see if it works. We could go from a thousand years worth of experimentation and guessing and things like that down to something that could take months or even days to get to a new type of material. And that's just one advancement, right? As Peter Diamandis says in his video, you know, they're talking about life extension as one of the major benefits of AI. And that's the kind of thing where all of this protein folding and other scientific breakthroughs that can be aided by AI can allow us to figure out why we age, why we get certain diseases, and then hopefully, <laughs> I'm hoping it happens before I get too old, and figure out how to counteract those things and allow us to live longer lives. As Dave Shapiro, who by the way, I'm going to have a chat with soon, so definitely subscribe for that because that'll be really fascinating. Anyway, as he and others have talked about a lot, we want to get to the longevity escape velocity. In other words, you want to add more years to your life through scientific discoveries and medicines and other kinds of techniques than you age. So in other words, I'm very, very close to 60 years old, and that's why I want to get to 100,000 subscribers, folks. <laughs> I told you I'd let the cat out of the bag. I'm going to be a quite an old person soon. But anyway, if, we, if I can add two years to my life every year that I get older, so in other words, if between medicine and other techniques, I can actually add my life expectancy goes from say 72 or something to 74 in the time that I get to 61 years old, then I'm actually, you know, I'm, I'm not aging as fast as my life expectancy will increase. And that's why many people in the AI world say don't die. That's their main commandment is don't die right now. Don't do something stupid and kill yourself because the odds are very high that we will actually get to a point where we will be able to live arbitrarily long periods of time as long as we don't do something stupid stupid like fall off a building or something. So in the future, if AI learns recursively how to improve itself, in other words, AI can focus its scientific research on itself and improve its code and get better faster and faster and faster, yes, we're going to reach an intelligence explosion. We're going to get to artificial general intelligence, then artificial super intelligence, and who knows where humans will be. Hopefully it will be like dogs. <laughs> I think my dogs have a pretty good life. So, you know, I wouldn't mind being treated like that and being able to be creative and do the things that I want to do. I've talked a lot about this previously on this channel, but people are big fans of watching other people play chess. They don't watch computers play chess. That's pretty boring, right? Nobody cares. It's about the human drama. So I think that there will be plenty for us humans still to do, but AI eventually will be able to pretty much take over the world of scientific discovery and making the world a better place. At least I hope that that's the case. Certainly the flip side is possible and we could end up in a dystopian world where they're controlling us a la the Matrix. But anyway, that that's at least, you know, several years, if not decades away from being a reality. But what is true right now is that these AI agents in science and in other areas can help the best researchers to be able to plow through experiments that humans, just by the limitations of us being meat bags, and it takes a certain amount of time for us to think about things and to do things and the fact that we have to sleep and eat and all of that stuff, and that there's only a small number of us who are trained really, really highly in any given area. If we can replicate thousands like Matthew Berman said in the MIT experiment, and then potentially hundreds of thousands or millions of these AI scientific research helpers, they can help us to come up with these discoveries way faster just through the physical reality of the fact that there are so many more of them and they think faster than us. And that is something that's happening today. This is not a tomorrow thing. This is a today thing. Now, society as a whole has not really seen the effects of this yet, but it will happen pretty soon. We will start to see the effects of this in medicine and in other other areas relatively rapidly, perhaps we will get a better, you know, glass so that it won't be able to shatter and I won't have to put a stupid case on the back of my phone every single time. But no matter how the AI gets focused on different things, whether it's on glass or biology or some other area of scientific advancement, including its own self AI research as well, we're looking at a world where tens or hundreds or thousands of years worth of human developments is getting compressed down into the order of, you know, just a year or two or even months or days. That's an incredible advancement. And I predict that the world is going to look so different in 30 years than it does today that it's going to be hard for people to even remember what it was like. A little bit like it was before the internet. It's hard to remember back to the 70s and 80s when you used to have to go to the library, look through the card catalog, go find a book. And if they didn't have the book, you'd have to do an interlibrary loan and maybe two weeks later it got it. Now you just do Google searches. And of course, now we have AI as well. 
But with the internet, you know, suddenly you were able to get pretty much all of the world's knowledge on your fingertips, and you could watch this video right now. You know, this is the kind of thing that was not possible 35 years ago. And so what I'm saying is if you project forward another 30 or 35 years, the world is going to be kind of unrecognizable at that point because the AI explosion is going to be even bigger than the internet explosion, and it's already started today. All right, so I hope you enjoyed that and found it thought-provoking and interesting. If you did, definitely let me know in the comments. And also, if you don't mind liking and subscribing, like I said, it really helps out the channel. I would love to get to 100,000 subscribers. And in the meantime, I will see you in the next video. Thank you.